and we are all burned out, and we just want to vent. <laughs> With that, welcome to the security table, <laughs> because that is the story of the week. <laughs> is that uh, it's been a long week for all of us, and so we're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about expectations of tooling in our industry. And when I say our industry, I mean the application security. Product security. Uh, machine? What, what's the, how do I describe this? It's, what, what do they call the defense industrial sector? Is there an application security industrial sector that we're talking about here? Is there a wow. tech? I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm Let's wow. not go there. Let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> You're already stepping wow. in the landmine. Come on. Oh, come on. That's no, seriously. Are we creating problems just so that we can write tools to solve them? That's oh, a good boy. question. That's a deep question right now. That's an interesting one. That's like an inception kind of moment, like the yeah. tool within the tool. But let's talk about expectations of tools. So when we think about application security, there's a big collective of tools that are commercial. There's a big collective of things that are open source that you can kind of connect together to get some of the same results. Like when you think about expectations of tools, like what are, what are your expectations of tools? Like let's, let's put together a, a list of things. Like what are we, what are we expecting our tools to do for us? So, Oh, you go. <laughs> so oh, mm, I think in a nutshell, the way I would characterize it is I expect a tool to do something a human could do only faster and more efficiently. So tool, a tool is automation and automation's job really should be a facilitator or something that humans can use to do tasks that they could do by hand, but but really they don't have to do it by hand. And, and in fact, the tool can do it more consistently and reliably, um, assuming it does its job and, and is correctly programmed in this case. Uh, you know, it's important to think about the classes of tools that we're talking about, not just whether they're free or, or commercial, but you know, are we talking static code analyzers? Are we talking vulnerability scanners? Are we talking uh, you know, network penetration testing tools? Uh, a host of, host of different types of tools do different things. And those things, again, could be done by humans, whether they do it by hand or they do it by scripts that they write. But really, we're taking sort of uh, industry knowledge, collective knowledge of the, of the industry and the community to feed these things so that they do their job well enough to replace, a lot, free up humans to do other things. Hmm. And, and, and in some cases, of course, we know that those other things can include verifying the results that come out of the tool. <laughs> so it doesn't mm -hmm. completely eliminate the human activity. Mm -hmm. Izar, do you agree with that general definition? <laughs> yes, but. <laughs> yes. I was going to say, I win. <laughs> Finally. Yeah. Izar is speechless. Finally, Only because I'm, somebody I, muted me. <laughs> it's because I muted him so that we could say he was speechless. What a joke. So, <laughs> Here's the thing, like, like like many, like most things in this this industry in this life, I, I I changed my opinion over the years, right? Once upon a time, tools for me were were exactly what what Matt described, but uh, over time I figured out that that expectation might be misplaced. I I might be looking for a silver bullet where not only they wouldn't give it to me, but they can't give it to me and fall into that scan and patch loop that we, we discussed the other week and all that, that stuff. And I, I think that what I look from a tool nowadays is more in terms of the auxiliary processes around what I need rather than the core knowledge. So yeah, it's, it's, it's great to have tools that check configuration, that check, you know, that check uh, 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 bombs and, and all that good stuff. But give me a tool that improves communication between the teams, and I'm as happy as. Give me a tool that reduces context switching for a, a, an application security engineer, and I'm mm -hmm. happy. 
give me a tool that lets me do uh, uh, remote threat modeling easier, it's good for me, right? So I, I think that we, we have a lot of tools that do security. We have less tools that support security, and I'm missing that. That's an interesting kind of angle you're taking on this in that tools and, and the context of where we live is, is security tools. They don't really focus on improving communication, collaboration, things like that. They focus on finding a particular result. And like I heard on another podcast in the context of Slack, and this just blew me away, right? Because people talk about the use of um, Slack and enterprise messaging as a better thing than email. Take a guess. We're gonna have a little. We're gonna have a little guessing time here. How often, on average, does a software developer check Slack? Three times a day. Okay, these are. I don't know. I, I know people who pretty much live inside Slack. So what's your guess? Matt's at three times a day. Constantly? Every six minutes. There you is go. Is the average of when developers, and these are people that are writing code. Mm -hmm. And they're in the flow state. They're, they're cranking. They're doing things. And every six minutes. And so that's a very interesting proposition that you're kind of, or, or I not prop, but point of, of the tooling that you're pointing out here is we haven't done anything to, to focus on collaboration and communication and, and the softer side of, of security. Tools have been all about just cranking out results and stacking them up for somebody well, to well, hopefully well, deal with can, someday. Can I wait, just, wait, J just yeah. to address that Slack thing? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's horrible. That's terrible. That's ridiculous. That's bad. We shouldn't be there. We should be actively getting out of that situation, right? And we keep stacking things and things on top of Slack. It, it's becoming a, a, a control center of sorts. You can start full processes from uh, Slack. You can get your notifications of those processes in Slack. And at the same time, it's eating at our attention span. It's eating at our context switching. I mean, it's not uncommon for people to be in, like, I don't know, 100 different Slack channels. Imagine being in a room, listening to a hundred people talking about different things at the same time, right? At least you go to, to, to Black Hat and people are talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. But imagine being in a room and you have to pay attention to 100 conversations and they are all happening in real time in different ways. And it's information that you need for your job. I want to throw so, one more stat. I want to throw one more stat at you because it's in this same thing that's going to blow your mind as well. I saw this as and 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 it's not has nothing to do with security. It has to do with interruptions. The average eighteen to twenty seven year old gets something like twenty five hundred notifications a day on their phone. Yeah, I have notifications turned off on my phone, but I'm old school. Like I don't like my phone. I don't want to be bothered. I don't want something to go bing 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 all day long because I know I'm on that same programming that everybody else is that if I get the bang up, oh, what's, what's happening, what happened, you know, what I need to know something that's happening. And so um, that, that one just blew me away too. I was like, wow, that's a lot of notifications, but people are texting all day long. They're, they're Snapchatting, they're Instagramming, they're doing all these other things that I probably don't even know that they're exist at this point. But once again, it's this, it's this constant interruption culture. I know that's not what we were going, but we're kind of, <laughs> we're kind of focused on this for a minute. So Matt, what, what are your thoughts? Oh, uh, so first off, I just want to, I, I think I, I misunderstood the question and Isar took us down a different path. I, I was avoiding the collaboration side of, of tooling because, well, that's a different space. I, I guess what you're, what you're really talking about is integrating security tools with communication platforms, right? Whether that be Jira or Confluence or you know those types of tools or Slack or Teams or whatever, some sort of messaging, because there are companies that do that for a living that are much better at that. And I thought we were talking about security tools, like things that operate on products or applications. So my mistake, but I understand where you're coming from, right? And, and that's absolutely a goal, should be a goal, right? Is, how do you communicate that information in a way that developers and others can take advantage of it quickly and efficiently? Right? But, because tools should be about efficiency and productivity. But, but Matt, that, that's exactly what I'm challenging. I think that we came to rely on things like Slack and Jira way too much 
just because everybody uses them. So we, we assume that the frictionless path is to go and work on them as well, right? Well, so I guess trends happen because, you know, people in the industry learn these platforms, they get comfort comfort with them, and then they collectively go, well, hey, we're all a group and we all know how to use Slack, so let's go ahead and use Slack, as opposed to, and, and it's, but as soon as something new comes along, there is a progression, right, to, to, to try and adopt those new things. So if you're not using Slack, what are you using, right? Companies may be using Teams. They may be using, I don't know, Mastodon or something. I don't know, but... Um, or they'd, they'd have to get tools. Mastodon installed at some point. But, so. but that's <laughs> the point. Good luck with that. <laughs> but that's the point. You, you just got into a more of the same thing, right? And what I'm saying is, you know, take a Purple Team exercise. You could do it over Slack. That'd be awesome. Yeah, it works great. And Slack now has uh, new features that do even better for you to share ideas and data and whatnot. But is that the best thing? Well, how do you, so how would you, so I guess rather than asking what the best tool is, what characteristics of that communication are you looking for? Great. That's the question. So again, in the purple team exercise, for example, I'm on the blue team. It would be great to see the screen of the red team in parallel as I'm there as they do their stuff and I see my stuff and I can correlate both of them in real time without it passing through some sort of a filter that needs to, they need to tell me now we're doing this and I have to interpret that and figure out what it looks like in my head and go mm -hmm. see my stuff, right? So, so it's taking, taking the collaboration tools out of the picture and making, cutting out the middle person, right? It's, it's going direct. It's, it's providing a, a tool that has the communication and collaboration built into it directly. I think it's more about not intermediating that, that exchange, that, that sharing through some kind of filter that may change what's being shared. Well, so, so if you go to Slack and you consider just text, uh, just text, right? I can send you a message saying, hey, here's what I'm doing right now. And you can answer, here's what I'm seeing right now. But if at the same time, I have a tool that shows me both screens at the same time and I can relate what I'm doing to, to what you are doing in real time, that makes my life much easier. I'm doing the interpre interpretations, not two filters, two human filters mm -hmm. with a media that perhaps can or cannot pass all that I need in order to know what's happening. It, that seems very specialized, right? That, that, that's, yeah, that's, like, yeah. very, that's very specialized for that use case. It's um, an extreme but, example. But maybe, that, I mean, maybe that's the right way to look about this, right? Is... I mean, you have to really, in order to choose a method, you have to know what your what characteristics you have. So that makes sense. Are there other things similar to that where this would become commercially viable, right? Because that's the next thing, right? Is oh, either, sure. either you're going to write it, you're, well, either you're going to write it yourself or you're going to make, or somebody has to build it. And sure, gonna you're going to squash it. our dreams by making something have to be commercially viable. Come on. Well, like or... Or pet pro pet science project for somebody uh, who can. I'm on, on, I'm on, I was thinking the same thing. Like as I started, to, <laughs> I was I was thinking about this myself, and I'm like, so wait, now we're in a world where I have separate communication channels in every tool in my security suite. So my SaaS no. tool has a a set of forums and conversations, <laughs> and my <laughs> RASP and my. SCA, they all have different, they all have these. So I end up with 27 different communication things that I have to do. Okay, so let, let's go there. Let's go there. So let's say you have those 27 tools and you have Slack in the middle. You're getting 27 different channels of information. Chances are that many of those are either related or the same thing viewed by a different tool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One category of tools that I am not aware exists broadly, I can think of one or two examples that I'm not going to, to mention, but that exist. One tool that would bring all these 27 channels together, figure out who's who in terms of who relates to whom and the different sources of information and whatnot, and present me that information in terms of five different pieces of things that say, hey, from all those 27, these are actually five things that those 27 things are telling me exist. Focus on these, not on the 27. Five is a much nicer number for me than 27. 
especially if I have to check it every six minutes. I mean, I think we just invented a category of AppSec tools that already exists called ASOC, Application Security Orchestration and Correlation, is a segment of the market that is focused on taking feeds from noisy AppSec tools, building or adding contextualization around results, and then giving you a view of that so you don't have 10,000 events. You ha- It's like a sim for AppSec. Yeah, I, I don't speak Gartner. And, and well, and, and the, and, <laughs> wow, and, and, that hurts, man. That hurts. He just <laughs> said I speak Gartner. Hey, you're the CEO. You're the CEO. <laughs> and then realist, realistically, of course, you could always ask Chat GPT, hey, monitor these feeds for me and, and give me the salient points. <laughs> And then Chad GPT starts hallucinating about, yeah, we, oh, there's a big problem happening right now because it somehow knew about some attack from years ago. It's happening now and everybody's freaking out. Okay. We, we said Chad GPT, we have to say PSS and threat model. That's it. Enough. Okay. We did mic drop. <laughs> Lead over. S-bomb. S-bomb. Well, all the jars are full now. Whoa, whoa. Matt, watch your language here. This is a fine <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we thought we were going to revolutionize the industry, but we we just reinvented a, apparently a Gartner category, even though there's <laughs> tools that exist in it. These are um, it's not just a Gartner category. I didn't get the memo. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're you going to get the sales calls. That's right. I'm going to I'm going <laughs> to sign you up for a bunch of demos and stuff <laughs> for people. <laughs> you're going to get all kinds of people. You know, reaching actually, out. apparently, that's a thing. I heard from people that didn't go even close to some conventions and whatnot. And all of a sudden, I go like the day after the convention, I started getting so much spam. So, so yeah, people out there for were signing up for other people. There is that's a, a good, uh, that's interesting there, social engineering attack, actually. Yeah. yeah there, it's, not, it's not difficult to, to manufacture the QR code, right? So you just slap mm-hmm. it on top of it. There is, I'll go a step further. I found there is a service. That will sign people up for email lists. So nah. If you want to, if you want to cause somebody difficulty, no. you put their email address in, and it'll go sign them up for like hundreds, if not thousands, of different legitimate email lists. So yeah. they start without getting, yeah, without come on, well, it's email so, it, verification yeah. and and approval is a joke when it comes. That's to That's why we can't have nice things, you know. <laughs> it is. I mean, can spam is. As a, as a legislation, like it, it has all of these things that people are supposed to do and penalties if they don't. But email is one of these things that people just abuse the heck out of without the proper approvals and things. I so, yes, know. you can just go there. I could sign up your email for 2000 email lists and none of those people are going to care that I didn't opt in properly. So I'm, I'm looking here at the... Uh homepage of uh, defect, defect dojo and it doesn't mention that category that you mentioned and that's actually my go-to when i need an example of a tool that does more or less what i would like to see other tools doing uh, defect dojo is not referring to themselves as an asoc at this point i don't think so which just makes them more in my <laughs> it's an open it's an open source application vulnerability management correlation and orchestration tool. Yeah, you see, by, a, by, by the time I finish themselves. saying that, I already got sixteen more alerts. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just check Slack real quick. Hold on, <laughs> six seconds. Have, have six minutes already passed? Yeah, yeah. six <laughs> seconds. Every six seconds, I check for new messages. So, so I mean, I think you're using you use Purple Team as a as a very concrete example here. Yeah, but it was an extreme example. Okay, so what's a more mundane example? Um, I mean, let's use a SaaS tool. Let's let's. How would you layer enhanced communication on top of a SaaS tool that isn't Slack and isn't Teams? So, I would look at I would look at GitHub as an example. So, if PR if PRs included SaaS, and you use PRs as a vehicle for shared code reviews and comments on code changes, right? That's something that GitHub does today, mm-hmm. right? Is that sufficient for you know, 90% of the use cases out there for when development teams need to do shared code reviews, peer reviews, um, you know, uh, security analysis, 
and and why restrict it to just SAST when you can have a, a build framework that also runs uh, other other tools? I'll, I'll I'll keep the keep the other four little four letter acronym out of out of that, uh, <laughs> right? But correlating other information together as part of a PR so so that changes can be can be taken into context and reviewed appropriately, right? Use the tools to assist the humans in doing their jobs more effectively. Mm. I think that GitHub is, is is a good example of something that lives in that boundary where developers and security people can meet and sort of start speaking the same language. Because the uh, some of the, the, the artifacts created by security tools in GitHub end up giving to, to developers something that they can immediately work with and have to interpret less. With that comes the fact that... Uh, if there is a thousand ways of doing something, there's a thousand and one ways of doing something. And it's an arms race for those security tools to create PRs that speak, I don't know, Terraform, whatever, the IAMO, whatever happens this week, right? Yeah, but in, in Matt's example, we're talking about native tools that are already integrated into GitHub. Right, but the I wasn't. I actually wasn't. I actually, sorry, I actually wasn't. Wasn't. I was saying tools that get integrated with GitHub, whether yeah, you it's were, okay, native with. Okay. Or, all right, but I, because... the output that they, they give has to work on whatever CI pipeline you have, right? And that's yeah. where you get the multitude of uh, of uh, uh, options, and and perhaps not every tool speaks that specific thing that you are using in your pipeline. But I guess so the we would agree that's is... a better practice, though, right? To use, ver I mean, it's, it's certainly better than having communication on Slack about results coming out of a scanning tool. Mm -hmm. like SAS, like having it integrated onto the PR, there's no better yeah. place you can put it to be in the developer's flow. Now I'm assuming they're using GitHub. Yeah. GitLab, GitHub, and pick your, pick your, pick your CI platform slash. slash well, slash, slash but but then I think that we, we fall into the discussion between a communication and action. So the PR is an action thing, right? The PR is check this thing that I'm that I as a tool am telling you you should do differently and enable it or or, or reject it. Uh, but uh, Slack is just hey I have something to tell you. But I think it's important though with GitHub it's a human it's a developer generated activity. I made a change, and the tool is doing all the workflow bits for I made this change. Help me review it before I commit it. It's again sorry. It's the loop. <laughs> so it, it starts the way that you said, but then you have an action that says, I checked your code, and by the way, there's a, a mistake in there, and here's a PR that fixed that mistake. Okay, so, so the tool helps the human be more efficient. It, it's it's going both ways, right? And I, I think that where the tools are verbose and create too many of those things, then you have too many of those things at two levels. You have too many PRs to review, and you have too many alerts about those PRs. Fair. So okay. the PR to review are going to stack up in your inbox in a GitHub. Is it called an inbox? No, I don't think so. And they're going to pile up in uh, in your Slack channel dedicated to that. And That's another... The... You've highlighted another challenge in modern tooling, though, in that the pattern that tool providers have followed so far has been create a tool that has a policy that looks for things and then reports everything it finds. There's no, like no, nobody has built a, a, an intelligent SAS tool that I'm aware of. And what I mean by an intelligent SAS tool is it doesn't just scan and dump out all of the things that are wrong with my code. It has some prioritization, some contextualization built into the SAS tool itself. And no, I'm not creating a new Gartner category here, by the way. Uh, there, there are tools that used to do that. I don't think they still do that, but there, there were some who, that who tried to do that. To do that. Coverity. Who? So Coverity tried, tried to, tried to, right? Okay. So they built a mo the model based. So rather than being, rather than doing the grep based thing, right? Uh, tools like Coverity that tried to do model. They did a model check approach, I believe, way back when. I'm not sure if they still do. Um, but they tried to, and I know as you're laughing over there, cause you know, results may vary, but they at least tried 
right? They tried to minimize false positives. Yeah, but they uh, still dumped – that doesn't – so they still dumped all the things they found. What I'm saying is nobody has has said, okay, no matter how we scan for results, that's half of what my tool does. Once I get the scanned results, now I have a higher order process that's going through and doing some prioritization, doing some oh, prioritization. Are, are. Oh, yeah, there are. Yeah, there are. There are. You yeah, can yeah. even do that with the, with any of the stat, SAS tool, commercial SAS tools out there. Yeah. You, I mean, you could then tell why like, do they oh, return for this type of results, result? though? Why because they're we... misconfigured. Because but, they're misconfigured. So, but I don't think anybody's doing. I don't think there's a SaaS tool that is intelligently providing me a summer. They may be doing a some some type of summarization. My point is, is there a SaaS tool today that will give me the five things that I really should fix before next Tuesday? Uh, it's the top day. five in the list, right? They're not going to say these are more important than those. It's, based on exactly, it's top five yeah. of five hundred. Like because I want like. But if you, so that's if you my configure... argument, though, is nobody has layered a, 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 a piece of any of these tools that does that for me, that gets me some re- legitimate, these are the five things I have to fix in the next month. Because I it's think... against the context, right? It's what we, we spoke the other, the other week. Right. We have yeah. to have these tools not only be more intelligent, sorry, smart, but we have to give them uh, visibility beyond the immediate line of code. Right. We, we have to somehow code where that code lives, what it does, how important it is, and then put all that into the mix and come out with something. But right, so... You, the, just I, a second, man. When you started describing your smart tool thing, the only thing that came to my mind was some scanner that you scan your code, it doesn't say anything. And you check the status code, and it goes back to you like, there's a problem. And you ask, what's the problem? It goes, well, if you don't know what the problem is, I'm not telling you. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes, we are building this. We are building this because it won't we won't have to do anything. All we'll have to do is pretend that a scan was run and then just provide that error code, which then they look in the man page and see that's the error code actually says if you don't know what this is, <laughs> you've got big bigger problems. If you have there. to ask, you can't afford it. <laughs> that's the IBM approach to error codes. <laughs> so so back so back to your to back to your prioritization discussion. So Tools today, by and large, I think, commercial tools especially, but probably some of the open source tools as well, mm-hmm. first off, have a ton of configuration options that probably nobody is using effectively. Yes. Right. So so you could say, you know, say pick a pick a SaaS tool and say, I want to I'll t- I'll pick Sonar Cube because it's open source, right? So it's it's free and available. I could say um, I want to um, I want to look at only Java vulnerabilities, and I want to only want to look the, look for those vulnerabilities that tie to a CWE top twenty five issue, right? And so, it, in theory, will filter out all of their scan results down to that set. So that's a, a that's a configurable option that gives some level of prioritization. Now I have so now I have a, a set that is constrained, right? Now add to that configuration options to say, well, I really want to bubble up to the top critical findings. Now, obviously it's going to decide what critical is, not you, right? Because it's not smart enough to know context, at least at that point. But that's where that's where some of these tools that do say control flow analysis, right? Can say, well, I get data from the outside and then it comes in and causes a buffer flow. That sounds more critical than something that only yeah. uses data internally. And if you pair that with information about the project, like this is an internet facing web application. Now you can do true prioritization. And there are tools that used to do this again. I don't know if they still do. Fortify was a good example. uh, And Tenable is another example from this, from the scanner side where um, you would provide information about the projects that you're scanning into a sort of a, a, like a control center, security center kind of thing. I think they, they called it security center. In fact, on the Fortify side, uh, and and that would tell you about this project is this type of application, and therefore that allows you to do some sort of business prioritization for the results that come out. And so they're not smart by any means, at least they weren't, in, and this is what I'm talking like a decade ago. So they weren't smart in that regard, at least not by today's standards. Mm-hmm. But it's not a stretch that you couldn't get there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's... That's, I think it's just a missing piece. I think it's a well, missed what, opportunity. I think what's really missing is the correlation of other data, right? So we're talking about SAST and we're talking about 
scanners. <laughs> the other you asked. can say SCA. It's okay. SCA is okay. I wasn't going to say SCA, but I was going to say, say I was going to use a, a D word that you don't want me to use. <laughs> you, mean, <laughs> you mean dead? The tool that, the tool that I now refer to as dead. Did, did I hear dread? Of tool? Uh, <laughs> or dread? So, so uh, but cor correlating information across all these tools to give you a complete picture that will give you prioritization. Right. Like I find you have an open port and that port ties to a piece of code and that code has a vulnerability. And mm -hmm. now I can know that, you know, that this is more severe than one that, that isn't. Yeah. And that's that's why we're seeing some startups now that are trying the mode of building their own SAST, SCA, the bad word. Um, and then other... No, SCA is good. Software composition <laughs> yeah. analysis. Yeah. Well, yeah, depends which SCA we're talking about. It's horrible <laughs> when we get to the point that we have to recycle acronyms. Oh, my God. Oh my but God. Two, people, two people can be talking about SCA, have two completely different uh, conversations, and it actually makes sense. It's terrifying. It's but like, my, my it's point like is, recently. My point is you've got, you've got some startups that are trying to build each of the pieces of the tooling so that they can build in the contextualization to have the SAS and SCA talk to each other and, and, and enrich the results coming out of it. Now, the challenge there is it's not best of breed. It's not, it's going to be tough to have best of breed in every category. If you're building all your own, maybe the contextualization will be enough to get you to market acceptance because the contextualization of three average tools in those various classes is worth more than best of breed in each of those categories that don't talk to each other. I don't know. That'll be for the market to decide. Now, let's let's take that to, to its extreme. Let's say that tools start being smart that way. Are we done with uh, security people? No. What, I don't what's think going so. to be missing? I think you still need you still need a human to provide context, and you still need a human to make certain decisions that the tool can't make, should not be making automatically. But given all that information, won't developers be able to do those to make those decisions? Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I wasn't. I was, well, that's a good. I guess a good I was ignoring place human for us to end for today. Which you know is kind of a strange way. To... <laughs> but here's what I want to talk about next time, and I think this is something that I've been kicking around, and I want to get both of your opinions on it. I see a future world where AppSec is no longer. I see a future world where development eats security, the security team. And I don't want to get into it. We don't have time to get into it today, but I want to put that on your, both in our, our listeners' minds to be thinking about, but also the two of you so you can chew on it. And then let's come back together next uh, for the next episode. Let's deal with that issue because I really want to understand I have strong opinions about it, but I want to get your takes as well from uh, coming from this from different perspectives. So let's wrap up for today and let's come back next episode and let's let's really wrestle with that issue and we'll have some time to prepare for it as well. So mm. thanks for listening to Security Table, folks. Have a great rest of your week. <laughs>